We're back in Matthew chapter 6. We read today from verse number 12 up to 15. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The Lord had blessing to the reading of His Word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to minister your most holy word. We seek your power, your sustenance, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to help us deliver on the mandate of heaven. So your people will have their needs met. Direction will be given. And then we will receive a touch from on high. We seek these mercies through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. You may kindly be seated. Today we are in part number nine of our ongoing series. What does God see in your life these days? We've been taking a practical look at what we have identified as top priorities of the kingdom as taught by Jesus. Our focus today is learning to walk in forgiveness. We'll do a small part now and then another small part in the coming week. We'll be done with that, and probably after that, we'll rest to the final stage of our series, uh, which has um, um, taken us a little bit of a while here. Learning to walk in forgiveness. In the last segment, we looked at learning to thrive by trusting God one day at a time. In fact, interestingly enough, on our way to church, uh, a song that I haven't heard in a long time uh, played on, on radio uh, one day at a time. And I thought, okay, this should have played last week when we were dealing with learning to thrive by trusting God one day at a time. We noted that life is filled with situations that vary from day to day. In our daily walk, we say it is a continual test of loyalty and trust in God. And we say that we need to learn how to handle today because how we handle today determines how we'll handle tomorrow. We also say, therefore, every situation is indeed an opportunity to thrive by trusting God, as we said, with emphasis, one day at a time. And so we were drawing that from that passage um, in verse number 11 of Matthew 6 that says, Give us each day our daily bread. And so we said we must seek to see God at work in every situation, no matter how hard. And we made a link of um, that, this passage to Romans 8, 28. We also looked at the Old Testament in Exodus 16 and Psalm 78, looking at God's dealings with the children of Israel. And with that, understood the definition of thriving as a desire for us to grow vigorously, to flourish, to progress towards or realize a goal despite or because of circumstances. And we distilled our lessons to three. Number one, that the power of experiential knowledge on a daily basis helps us to get a handle on the things we're discussing here. Knowing that in Paul's words, and we know that in all things God is at work. So that experiential knowledge is a privilege God has given to us. Secondly, we looked at the pulse of inner growth on a daily basis. And we say that that inner growth comes from the fact that we understand that in, inside all those circumstances, God is at work. And so that led us to the third lesson, the potency of divine intervention, emphasizing that God works for the good of those who love him, uh, who have been called according to his purpose. So as we look at today's lesson, learning to walk in forgiveness, we're actually just sliding now to the next um, level of emphasis that Jesus placed on prayer as he taught the disciples how to pray. And remember, our whole series has been based on Jesus priming prayer as an act of righteousness. Um, and having began in verse number one. So at this stage, Matthew's use of the term debt 
must draw attention to us because it says, forgive us our debts. Now, we're living in a day where the issue of debt is a very topical matter for nations. But this is more than just an issue of debt that's old in reference to money that we are very familiar with. The reference, the term debt here in Matthew translates moral debt. And that moral debt is really an issue of sin. So Matthew here is where he was referring to sins. That is why Luke in chapter 11 verse 4, reflecting and narrating the same incident that we're looking at relating to Jesus here, uses the term sin. So when you look at uh, Luke chapter 11, verse number 4, Luke says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. So there is an equivalence there. The term debt is not debt in reference to money owed per se. It is really uh, moral debt and the moral debt that we owe is as a result of sins that we have committed. So it's amazing that this is what sets the stage for what I consider to be one of life's greatest tests for the believer, walking in forgiveness, walking in forgiveness. The term forgiveness is something we are familiar with. Actually easier said than done. And should believers be thinking about forgiveness? Yes. So what is forgiveness? I thought of doing this from my own personal angle, and here is my rendering. Forgiveness is a state of one being released from a wrong. One being released from a wrong. A wrong they have committed. And the release should come after due confession, or in this case, repentance. So if you've done something wrong against me, and you say sorry, and I observe for sure that this is real and genuine, my responsibility is to forgive him. If I have wronged you, and I am able to say sorry, and even if you don't say sorry, according to what we will learn today, even if you don't say sorry to me, I am obligated to forgive you. Now, you will be owing something if you don't say sorry, if you don't apologize. You'll be owing something in the sense that what you're supposed to do, you haven't done. But for me who's been wronged, it is not just conditioned upon someone saying sorry. I am under obligation to forgive. Are we understanding? That is the principle of forgiveness. But when we look at the scenario that is presented in the Bible, we have to see two things that emerge. First, the forgiveness of a sinner. Secondly, us forgiving one another, which I've just narrated here. And life is full of those circumstances where you, you are on test and trial to see how real you are and how much you appreciate the forgiveness that God has given to you. And in the passage we have read, a portion that we usually miss is the last part of verse 15, where God says, if we do not forgive men, God will not forgive us. Now that's easy to overlook, because I see, I see that in life, we can actually coast along by simply keeping away from those people we consider our enemies, and never seeing them. And that's how we sort of hush hush the aspect of whether we're dealing with forgiveness or not, or whether we're working in forgiveness or not. It's hush hush, as long as we don't see them. You see them coming this way, you just choose a different route. And in your heart, you feel like, yeah, I just don't ever want to see that person again. 
And for as long as I don't see them, it's okay. No, it's not okay. Are we together? It is not okay. That's what we will discover here today. So why did the Lord bring up this matter in relation to prayer? That's really the big question. I would like to share three reasons why, and those three reasons become our lessons for today. The three reasons why I believe the Lord Jesus brought up this matter within the context of teaching on prayer is, number one, the reality of our battle with sin. As human beings, saved or unsaved, there is a continual battle with sin. Now let's start with those who are saved. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7. Let's start with those of us who are saved. The battle with sin. This is the first major reason why our Lord Jesus, while teaching on prayer, brings in the matter of sin. It's a recognition that it is a battlefield. First John chapter 1, verse number 7. But if we walk in the light, so this is an arena of believers. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin. So this is the state of a believer. We've been purified from sin. But look at verse number eight. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not with us or in us. On the other hand, if we confess our sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And verse number 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So you can see, beloved, that there are some serious considerations there brought out by the Apostle John, which clearly are within the Lord's mind as he is drawing these disciples and drawing us as believers to this area of beginning to consider how critical the matter of sin is when we consider coming before the Lord. Meaning there's a constant battle. It means that it could stand in the way of our making progress with prayer. It means that this is a matter we have to constantly deal with. And in this particular case, the call by the Lord Jesus Christ is with the understanding that as human beings, even after we have been saved, self tends to take center stage. And because self takes center stage, it is so easy to be saying words that we consider to be prayer and to be thinking that we are making headway and accessing God when in actual fact, sin stands in the way. In Isaiah 59, the Bible is very clear. God says that his hand is not short that it cannot save, nor his ear dull that he cannot hear. But he says, your sins have separated between you and your God. Give me Isaiah 59. Let's just reflect on that briefly before we come back to uh, our consideration. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. 
prayer is essentially seeking God's face. It means that when we desire to be effective in the area of prayer, there must be a deliberate way of dealing with the issue of sin. That is why in very basic teaching regarding prayer, we start with confession and repentance. Every day. Because sin in this life is like the particles, the particles in the, um, uh, the dirt particles in the atmosphere that settle on our garments. My suit may be looking immaculate as usual, but I can assure you just the fact that I have worn it for, uh, uh, say, maybe an hour or two now since the time that I dressed up, I can assure you there are particles that I've settled here, that I won't see. But which you require that after a while, this garment here must be laundered. It must be taken into into a laundry mart so it can be cleaned, because surely there's no way I can keep appearing immaculate here and, and, and looking clean without it being laundered. That's what happens with sin. It contaminates, touches on us. So on a daily basis, when we come before God in prayer, we must deal with those issues of sin. So if we go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 1, we will observe something similar. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So the danger of contamination from sin is real. So when we come in prayer, the first point of call is confession. Asking God to cleanse us. And this is what Jesus is doing here. Calling attention to that. But then he draws attention towards a very subtle area of sin. Where you are dealing with wrongs that people do against you. Because there, they have sinned by wronging against you. But you also sin by not forgiving them. This is what Jesus is talking about. And so he says, when you come before me, pray and say, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us, meaning those who have sinned against us. Then in verse 15, he says, if you do not forgive men for the sins they've committed against you, God will not forgive you of your sins. Today, I want you to think about people in your life who have wronged you, who have not treated you well. And let us ask whether you have handled that matter adequately enough that you can say I am okay this is an area that is easily neglected I talked about our challenge with self so let's go back to Philippians chapter 2 and reading verse number 3 Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Ouch. Ouch. Our tendency as human beings, when you see somebody, you always want to put yourself here and that person there. Definitely, it is not a general disposition to see somebody and say, yeah, there comes somebody who is better than me. No. 
Our norm as human beings is to always put somebody down and ourselves up. Last week, we had the day of national prayer, fasting, reconciliation. And we had an opportunity to remind our leaders about the need to conquer self-interest. And I say to the leaders, it is, for all of us as human beings, dealing with self-interest is tough. But I say to the leaders, it's harder for those of us who lead. Harder. Much harder for us. Because you see, power or any role of leadership is so, is so deceitful that it's easy to think about just what, 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 what can accrue to you and what is advantageous to you. I'm saying it's, it's more difficult when you are leading because now you have an opportunity to have so much else that can go for you in terms of advantage. But this is a struggle not just for those in leadership. It's a struggle for every single individual. Self-interest. And because of our focus on self, it is very hard to deal with the issue of forgiveness. Because you do not want to feel like somebody is released, they are let go of. It's like they go free. Especially if you are, it is, they are aware they are wrong and you are aware they are wrong. You sort of want to keep them there. Are you normal? Do you ever feel that way? Okay, I want to make sure I'm talking to normal people. <laughs> That's the human flesh. So you sort of want to keep it there. No, 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 no. According to the Lord here, if you want to keep it there, so this person can sort of feel either your weight or the consequence of the wrong they've committed against you, I want us to deal with what Jesus says here, that if you and I do not forgive, we must be prepared for God not to forgive us. Hello. That's what the Bible says. We must be prepared for God not to forgive us. So, this issue of selfish ambition, self-centeredness, look at verse number four of Philippians two. Each of you should look not only on your own interests, but also on the interests of others. Ouch. Verse number five. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This is why Jesus is teaching that way here. Who being in the very nature God. So power was in his hands. And did not consider equality with God as something to be held on to. Verse number seven. But made himself nothing. Oh my goodness. Made himself nothing. This is the Jesus way. Taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. Verse number eight. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. So it's very simple, beloved. Very searching. I want you to think about people in your life that have done wrong to you. In case this is something you've been leaving hanging and not dealing with, this is a call to a place where if your prayer is to make headway, you need to deal with forgiving someone that has wronged you. That needs to be handled. It's unfinished business. And this goes on in life. It goes on in families. I know. And let us not pretend. But we must deal with this if we are to make headway with prayer in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Our desire is to have impact. Our desire is that when we come before God and we say, Oh God, our Father who art in heaven, that we have nothing impeding us and we are making straight access and making headway and reaching God. But we must understand that this is a holy God, that he's serious with the issues of sin, that when we allow contamination to place, to stay there, and we don't deal with it, the prince 
principle is that your sins, your iniquities will separate between you and your God. No matter how spiritual your jargon might be, no matter how long your prayers might be, no matter how often you may fast, your sins will be an impediment. They will separate between you and God. And we must make this a very serious issue. That is why as Zambia, we keep calling ourselves to seriousness. That is why last week, as we were praying, we were calling upon our leaders to take this very seriously and to understand that prayer is not lip service. We've got to come to a place where we deal with issues that are outstanding for so long. And I want us to understand that as much as we call upon our political leaders to settle their scores and it is so sad that you see headlines and you see people maintaining perpetual enemies for life and I call upon us as a nation to be in serious prayer as we go towards 2021 because unless people settle their issues sometimes they will use the church as a, as a scapegoat for this or the other but what we say to the leaders last week is that they themselves as leaders in the political arena must see the need to go to one another and say Say to one another, forgive me because we want a better Zambia. This issue of forgiving someone, no one else can do it for you. You know who you consider an enemy. You know who you consider to be not so friendly, not so favorable. You know. So it's your job. It's your job to deal with that matter. The battle with sin is a very serious one. You need to handle your cousin. You need to handle your uncle. You need to handle your nephew. You need to deal with your stepmother. You need to deal with your uncle. And release them. They may have mistreated you. But you can't keep that forever. That sin of unforgiveness will keep you from making impact and making headway. I'm reaching God. Is the church hearing the message of Jesus today? You see, where forgiveness has not been handled, nations have gone into atrocities that are very, very terrible, where people might use power to fix enemies. And sometimes a nation can degenerate into a lot of ills. But let's take it away from that arena and deal with just ourselves as ordinary believers and ordinary citizens. Our tendency to put self first is a hindrance. May God help us. I want to move to the second reason why the Lord Jesus brought this up, which is our second lesson. The need for true repentance, not just confession. So we talked about confession as the first place where you confess your sins, the Lord forgives you, you repent and turn away so you don't go back to those sins. Let's, let's deal with this aspect a little more deeply. And what I've done today with the help of the Lord is chosen just a few key passages with a little meditation on them. We find what our steps need to be. So we're going out to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and um, verse number 10. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. That's just the word for that is, is remorse, where somebody is just, just simple remorse. Simple remorse is, is, not, is not enough. When we're talking about this act of forgiveness, it means that there is sorrow deep inside that leads to repentance. Repentance means turning away and leaving the thing that has been keeping you away from God turning around, saying sorry for it. And he's not simply saying sorry because you've been caught or sorry because you've been found out. No, it's a deep sorrow from deep within 
that says, look, I not only regret what I have done here, I'm not going to go back. This is an act that I will not keep repeating. I want to turn on and go back to God. Repentance is turning around completely. And in this particular case, the depth of what happens deep inside one's heart is what this is about. Forgiving one another has to be from the heart, from deep inside, never to go back to the words that made you... um, uh, get into that state of, log, of, of, log, of being at loggerhead with someone else. Away from that. So, look at the condition. I want to take you back to, second, to Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. Just look at the condition that the Lord lays. The condition is this. For if you forgive men, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Hallelujah. Your heavenly father will forgive you. Have they, has somebody sinned against you? Yeah, that may be so. What do you do? Forgive. And like I said, this is an area we forget and neglect. And God says, when we do that, he also forgives us. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. This is extremely sobering. And I trust that you and I will see the deep need for forgiveness from the heart. You know, people live in life um, with, with burdens that they carry. And in these families within life, there are issues that sometimes don't easily get settled. And in the church of Jesus Christ, we need to make sure that our relationships are given prime attention. Are we together? Because this is what holds us together. So, when something happens or something goes wrong, see to it that time is taken to address that matter. We've had moments in our own times of ministry where you have people that you get to learn about for a while that you know maybe have issues with you and you may never have chance to probably reach them. But when you know that this thing is affecting your faith, you immediately Deal with it by releasing them. Hello. So, I'm taking you back today. There's lots of homework here. To your stepmother. To your uncle. To your stepfather. To your former spouse. For those of you who maybe have had some tough moments and maybe you, you know, had to leave a marriage or something happened that you didn't want, but something has happened. And when you have that kind of condition, a failed marriage, there is a former spouse that you have to deal with. Release them. You can't hold bitterness in your heart. So that now the sight of any man makes you feel like... "Mm." Or the sight of any woman, just because you had that one bad experience with your former spouse. Sight of any woman, you just, I want to have nothing, nothing to do in life with any woman anymore. You're living in bitterness. This might sound laughable, but this is real. You're living in bitterness. Forgive. Let go. Release that person. No matter how evil they may have been, to you, release them, forgive them. Okay, before I go much further, let me remind you and I, think of all that we have done against the Lord and think about Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. If Jesus can forgive you. Who are you to not forgive 
your former spouse, your step your step uh, father, your stepmother, your former employee. Ah, former employees also suffer unforgiveness. Your former employee, they dismissed you rather recklessly and rather dishonorably when in fact you were innocent. You know what? That may be the case, but forgive them. You know the issues of former employees in our country are real. They're very real. I know people, I'm a pastor, so I know what I'm talking about. I know people who've never recovered from redundancies that happened years ago and things like that. Well, the impact may be there now and it's understandable, but on your part, forgive that former employer. <laughs> Former business partner. Hello. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord, okay? Former client. <laughs> Once it becomes a former, it's former. <laughs> ah, I tell you. Yeah. So, beloved, this is very delicate. And I'm praying that God is helping you today. Amen. Okay, quickly, I want to wrap it up. Because we'll have a second part to this. So let me run on to the third and final point for today. The need... The third reason why Jesus brings this up is that there is need for us to forgive one another. And in one sense, I've said it already, it's just that the three lessons have to be clearly walked through uh, so that we understand the reality of our battle with sin, the need for true repentance, not just for confession, and thirdly, the need for us to forgive one another. So let's go to Ephesians 4, and we'll wrap it up shortly. Ephesians 4. Now, this one. <laughs> In fact, let's begin it at, um, at uh, verse 31. So get rid of all bitterness. <laughs> Did you hear that? Get rid of 60%? 70%? Okay, let's try 90. Uh, how about 95? Okay, how about 99.9999%? He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. See, when you have unforgiveness, you will malign someone constantly. You will have no kind word for them. Just the sight of them on the news. Ah, sh switch off this TV. Ah. <laughs> or better still, break this TV. You know? <laughs> and all because the person that you don't like has appeared on that TV. <laughs> and you know the way God has it. That person... Maybe the one in the news that week. So they always appear. <laughs> ah. So I've heard people say, no, it's just, just the mention of the name. No, we are a lumpula or some gamba or you Meaning, don't say his name. Okay, verse 32. Verse 32. The Bible says, be kind. Hallelujah. Be kind and compassionate to one another. For giving one another. And look at the balance. Even or just as Christ forgave you. Now we know that that's the standard. 
And Jesus himself in teaching says, for if you don't forgive men for the sins they've committed against you, God will not forgive you. That's how serious it is. So, I'm asking us today to take prayer very seriously. If we go to Matthew 18, it gets more serious. Verse 35, after Jesus gives a whole uh, parable of the unmerciful servant, he says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, if you read that parable, this ungrateful servant was eventually taken and thrown into jail because he had been so ruthless against his fellow servant. And sometimes we are so ruthless with one another. Beloved, in the church and outside, sometimes we're so ruthless. This is a matter we need to handle and handle squarely. Not tomorrow, but right now. Did you hear me, beloved? We must handle this matter right now. It stands in front of our progress. If we are to progress, we must deal with this issue of bitterness and unforgiveness, especially for us as believers. In fact, for believers, the standard is set. Verse 15 of Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Show him your fault. That's the standard. Show him your fault. And the Bible says, show him your fault between the two of you. You don't take a witness just there and then, no, please come with me. No, no, no. no. He says, show him your fault. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. Settle it. Not that after you settle, he said, oh, you were calling me yesterday. You don't know where I went. Ask me where I went. Ask me where I went. Oh, okay, where did you go? No, I went because, you know, you remember, eh, and so you begin narrating now. Listen, if you settle the matter between the two of you, keep it that way. God will bless you. You don't in the name of, oh, no. So please pray for him, you know. I've told him, and I know he has said sorry, but pray for him, you know. This area of uh, unforgiveness, you know, as the bishop was preaching, this area of unforgiveness and uh, bitterness is very slippery, you know. So pray for him. You know, just, just pray for him. Um, usually it's the ladies. You know, just pray for her. Yeah. And just pray, just, just pray for her. You know, no. If you settle the matter between the two of you, let it remain there. It doesn't need to become headlines the next day in social media times. Hello. Or then after you've done that, then you go and post, you change your status and say, to forgive is divine. <laughs> so now everybody must guess What's going on? Status has just changed. To forgive is divine. <laughs> this is how we wallow in self-interest. Beloved, this act that we're required to do is an important one. When we do it right, we will be blessed. Hallelujah, we will be blessed. Hallelujah. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Let us make a goal to win each other's over. Win your brother back. Win your sister back. Come together. We have a lot of work to do for the kingdom. Let us do it by forgiving one another and going on for the gold in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So, in wrapping this up, I must take us back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and remind us of what Christ did for us, which is eternal, and remind us of our future estate as a church. So those two passages, 
2 Corinthians 5 and Revelation 5 just now as, I, as we wrap up. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning, very quickly, beginning at verse number um, 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, it's a new creation. Old has gone, the new has come. Verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Learning to live in forgiveness. Next, verse 20. That God was reconciling the world of verse 19 to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20. We therefore, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now verse 21 is, is extremely powerful and potent. God made him to be seen for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Remember, prayer is an act of righteousness. And Jesus, in teaching about prayer, says you can't come before God without asking him to help you handle your sin matters. And the sin matter we are focusing on today is that of forgiving one another. May God help us. Look at the final estate of the believers in Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse number 11. Revelation 5, verse number 11. Number 9. Let's start at verse number 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain and your blood Purchased men for God. Purchased men for God. That is with that act of forgiveness. From every tribe, every language, and every nation. You see how tribalism has hindered us affecting God's work on the face of the earth. You see how regionalism has hindered the affecting of God's unity in our systems, in our nations, and many locations where we are found. And when we deal with those things, God helps us to enjoy the final estate that he intends for the church and his people to be in. Let's carry on. Verse number 10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Verse number 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten uh, ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. Verse number 12. The Bible says in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And verse number 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in heaven singing to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be glory and honor and power and forever and ever. This is the final estate. But we can't be in that state of this level of bliss and honor to worship God freely unless we have dealt with these hindrances. We can't stand before the Lord. You know the picture of Joshua, the high priest in the book of Zechariah, standing before the Lord. But then there was the issue of Filthy garments. We can't come before him like that. We've got to divest those things. And we divest them by taking care of business number one. Forgive. And when we forgive, God forgives us. And the door is open. We've been covering this in Bible study. And talking about the fact that when we join the host of heaven in that arena of worship. 
we must understand this is the atmosphere of heaven. The reason why when we, our hearts are right and we just connect with God, the reason why we immediately feel a change of atmosphere and the presence of God is because God, God allows us to experience the state of what is happening in heaven. Heaven is in a place where there is constant honor and praise and worship. The 24 elders and the, the, the creatures that are around the throne constantly are saying holy, holy, holy. And I've been saying during Bible study times that that atmosphere will automatically come when our hearts are right, when we've forgiven one another. We come together like this automatically. When our hearts get into the wavelength of heaven, automatically we begin to experience Something totally different around us. The presence of God comes when sin is handled, when there is forgiveness. The presence of God comes. You sense that the atmosphere is different. That is the norm of a Christian life. We can experience that while courting sin and bitterness and everything else. We may sing and sing and sing. We will not fully experience the presence of God. And I want to invite us to that place where we can say together to him who sits on the throne and their lips that are saying this are real. Their hearts are genuine. Their hearts are clear. We've taken care of business and it glorifies God to see his children living with that sense of freedom, of mind and heart, where nothing is standing in the way. The way is clear. And you know that you're seeking God and God alone. Not that while you're trying to worship, you remember, oh no, that uncle, why did he do that? Holy, oh, no, 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 no. Take care of business. I assure you, it's a place of release. That's why there's one song that says there is a place of full release near 